Blomcast. Turning Points in History. Wendepunkte in der Geschichte. Welcome to the Blomcast, the podcast that looks at changing points in history. And today I'm really excited that after a long and hot pursuit, I've been able to secure an audience with Kenan Malik. Um, Kenan, we've known each other for a few years. Um, we have been following each other's works, reading each other's works. We have had occasion to speak on podiums at festivals, but also at long dinners. And there's never been an evening, there's never been a conversation with you when I didn't hear an insight I hadn't thought before, when I didn't come away a little bit cleverer than I've been before. And I'm really excited to speak to you um, in the context of this podcast. Thank you. That's, I'd say that's very kind. I'm not sure that's true, but that's very kind. I can, I can assure you all that it is entirely true. Now, um, this podcast is listened to a little bit in Britain, but quite a lot also in South America and in Germany and on the continent. Kenan, can you, can you just uh, introduce yourself so that people um, get a little bit of an idea what your work is and how you come to it? Sure. I'm a, I'm a writer, essentially. I, I have a column for The Observer, which is the Sunday version of, of The Guardian. And a lot of people knew you from that, yes. Uh, yes. Um, uh, and um, uh, most of my work is, is really about the history of ideas. Um, and uh, initially, uh, my books were ra largely on questions of the re relationship between race Uh, between um, science and, 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 and society. Um, but I've also, the, the, the theme of race has been a, a central um, interest of mine. Not because I see race as a way of understanding modernity more broadly, that it's, it's a, that the, concept, the idea of race, I look at it differently from many people, I, I understand it. Which is exactly why I want to talk to you um, in, in about this context, about race and modernity. You're also the author of, well, your two last books are The Quest for Moral Compass, in which you look at culture and morality. And um, here we are, not so black and white, um, in which, well, a history of race from the white supremacy to identity politics. So we'll have a great deal to talk about um now this is this is a this is a discussion about identity about the politics of identity but also i remember in one of our first conversations you said something that really struck me about your own origins um and you said as a young man i used to consider myself as black and that was the political fight we were fighting can you elaborate on that Sure, I, I, I think that that is a, actually a peculiarly British concept. That um, when I was growing up, we're talking about the late seventies, the early eighties. Um, I'm that old, yes. <laughs> Where was that? In, in first in Manchester, um, and then in in, in London. Um, that to be black was not an ethnic um, label. It was a political label, uh, and so someone like me was black. But that, from a perspective of Van Day, is is fantastic. Well, yes, it changed. It changed. You know, by the end of the eighties, that had already begun to change, um, and blackness had become a an ethnic label rather than a political label. But black was really, um, I suppose, what we'd now say is non-white. Um, but in, in, in a kind of broader, more inclusive sense. Um, and that was, that was um, there are people of a certain generation who understand that when, when, when I say, um, because they grew up in, in, in that period too. But nobody these days understands what I mean. When, if, if, I was to, if I was to call myself black, people would be um, astonished, yes. 
Well, but it's it's a fantastic idea that, I mean, you legitimately can say you were black and now most people would no longer consider you black. And yes, and yet we are dealing with categories that most people would describe as clear cut and definitive. Yes, that it shows how, how those how those kinds of notions change over time. Yes. Now, let's just we're both historians so um it would be foolish not to let's just go back because um ethnic difference has always been observed of course um cultural difference has always been observed and perhaps a kind of cultural supremacy a cultural chauvinism can be observed in many cultures that simply consider themselves better than others simply consider their own interests more legitimate than those of others. Um, but for the longest part of history, all of that nastiness could live perfectly well without adding the concept of race. How come? Well, the f first thing, actually, is, is to pick up something. You, you, you're saying that ethnic um, categories have always existed. Well, they haven't, because ethnicity itself, as a term, is a, is a relatively modern term. It, it only comes in in the 1930s when people were looking for a word to describe racial differences without talking about race um, because of the, the impact of Nazism um, um, on uh, people's perceptions of race. But yes, the, 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 the point I'd make is this, that um, the concept of race is a modern concept, a, a concept of modernity. And that, you know, one of the paradoxes of modernity, and particularly of the post-enlightened world, is that it is both the source both of equality and of inequality, and it is the source of both concepts of race and of racial inequality. And as you say, you know, when to say that race is a modern concept is not to say that prejudices or the categorization of different human groups are not deeply rooted in the in, in the pre-modern world. I mean, um, notions of difference, uh, inequality, and ideas about the inferiority and the subhumanity of certain groups were integral to to pre-modern consciousness. But paradoxically, that's also why such prejudices were a long way from racial ideas in the modern sense. Because only in a world in which print the principles of social equality and a common humanity have become widely accepted can ideas of inequality and racial difference gain meaning. In the pre-modern world, um, these were just the way things were. But with modernity, and um, particularly with the Enlightenment, comes the idea of equality which is, again, a, a relatively new notion. I mean, it's, it's always existed. The notion of equality has always existed in various traditions. It's worth pointing out what a scandal it was when it was discussed again in the 17th century, because I think very much, as you point out, those were societies founded on inequality. Everybody knew that a nobleman was better than a peasant, a Christian was better than a heathen, a man was better than a woman, and that was the foundation of the moral order. So to speak in equality in a world like that was scandalous from the start. Absolutely. Um, and, and that, um, but what was surprising was that it didn't take that long then for those ideas then to have social purchase. We're talk, talking about, what, 150 years? maybe um so by the by the 19th century the idea of equality and of a common humanity was largely accepted but that's where the that's where the problem arises because um we you have a world in which on the one hand there is a there is a, a an abstract belief in equality and and kind of the great revolutions of the world you know, um, of, of the 18th century. Um, there are three, actually, but, but two of which we know about. Um, the French Revolution and, 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 and the American Revolution are both built on the idea of human equality, you know, the rights of man, um, the, uh, the, 
the, the idea that, that all humans are born equal and so on. But so there is an abstract belief in equality. But in practice, these societies were deeply unequal um, to the extent of, 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 of enforcing slavery. So there, has, there had to be a way of thinking about, about this, about legitimising and justifying inequality in society. You needed a moral workaround. Yeah, and race became that bridge, if you like. Um, you know, most people assume that racism begins or emerges when members of one race begin discriminating against members of another. And that racism is what happens when races collide. In fact, historically, it's the opposite that happens, that intellectuals and elites began dividing the world into uh, uh, distinct races to explain and justify the differential treatment of certain peoples. The ancestors of today's African Americans were not enslaved because they were black. They were deemed to be black and an inferior race to justify um, their enslavement. There's a fantastic diary I found from a 17th century slave captain who is at the beginning of the triangular trade across the Atlantic. And he, uh, he keeps a diary, and he's a very ordinary bloke, and he is inflicting huge cruelty on a lot of people on his ship. And he says, uh, well, honestly, I can't see any difference between these people and me. It pleased the Lord to make their skin one color and my skin another color, but surely we should all share a huge, uh, common humanity. He says that while enslaving them and while being part of this system, but it's so interesting because he's before this, he, he writes before the switch has been made. Sure. Before the racial theorists in Europe come and argue the inferiority of blacks in order to justify their enslavement. If, if he'd written a hundred years later, it, his tune would have been very different. Sure. I mean, I, I, I think that there are kind of two issues there. One is that this is not simply a question of skin colour. I mean, if you look at the writings of um, uh, middle-class thinkers and intellectuals you know, from the 17th, 18th centuries, towards the poor at home, towards the, the nascent working class, um, who weren't yet a working class, but the nascent working class, you have almost the same kinds of discussions. And there were discussions... Um, in in England, um, I, I know about the discussions in England. Um, I assume that the same discussions elsewhere about the possibility of enslaving the poor, um, of um, of, main, of of those that could not pay their way in society to be enslaved as as just uh, that that became the justification. I mean, it, it, there are lots of historical reasons why that never happened. But if you look at the treatment of indentured servants, white indentured servants in in um, the Americas, compared to that of um, African slaves in the Americas, if you look in the six in the seventeenth century, from about you know, the, the 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 early sixteen um, twenties to to about the end of that century, um, the treatment wasn't that different. The passage across the Atlantic was was tremendously different because indentured servants did not have to um, uh, suffer the, the, the horrors of, of, of the of the transatlantic uh, middle passage. Um, but they but but uh, but once they arrived in um, the West Indies, in the Caribbean, or, or in in America, their treatment was not that different. Um, in many ways, actually, white indentured servants were worked harder than slaves because slaves were slaves for life, whereas indentured servants were only um, indentured for uh, uh, five or seven years. Um, so it was common for, for masters then to get a court order to, to extend uh, that indenture for a, for a few more years. But because they were only, work, they were only there for five or seven years, they were worked harder because it didn't matter if they died at the end of the five and seven years. It didn't matter if slaves died. 
Um, um, and at the beginning of the 17th century, the kind of the brutal economics of of enslavement meant that it was cheaper to have indentured servants than to have slaves. By the end of the century, it was cheaper to have slaves than it was to have indentured servants. Um, and so the kind of the, 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 the brutal economics of slavery um, and of enslavement shifted the pattern. But at the beginning of the, of the century, um, most masters, planters would have preferred indentured servants to, 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 to slaves. Would it be fair to say that this reality of slavery that then became also, as you say, an economic reality, and of course even um, later um, the abolitionists come up against the argument mostly of it being economically impossible to end slavery because so much of the economy is reliant on it. Uh, but would you would you say that it's fair to say that the institution of transatlantic slavery gave us the concept of race and really cemented it in our heads? No, I, I, I don't think that's right. Um, it's not that slavery gave us gave the concept of race. It is more that um, slavery was one of the kind of gravest inequalities in societies that that that. that Um, consider themselves um, beholders of or, or defenders of equality, and therefore it required justification and and legitimization, um, unlike um, other forms of 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 of, um, of bondage, um, or to to a greater degree than other forms of bondage, and slave and slavery certainly transatlantic slavery racialized. Um, slavery in a way that no previous forms of slavery had. I mean, slavery has existed and or had existed until you know from from almost the beginnings of humanity. But um, if you look at pre-modern slavery, um, it wasn't considered. It, it wasn't organized in 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 a, in a racial way. So European slavers, um, slaves working in Europe, um, used other European groups as slaves. I mean, this, the very word slave comes from Slav, um, because a lot of slaves for um, the European market were from um, the Balkans and from um, the Caucasus. Um, the Islamic Empire, which also had slaves, of course, also did not distinguish uh, between slaves in terms of skin colour until pretty late on. Um, Though, of course, no Muslim could be enslaved, only Christians could be enslaved, or, 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 or heathens, as they'd see them, could be enslaved. Um, but it was with, with the coming of transatlantic slavery that, that race becomes an issue. But it doesn't, it's not an issue at the beginning. It becomes an issue as slavery develops and takes hold in, in, um, in, 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 the Americas. And there are two reasons. One is what I've already talked about, what we've already talked about, which is the necessity to, to justify and legitimize um, such a grave form of injustice and, and, and um, inequality in societies that had a claim to equality. The other is that it becomes a means of um, undermining um, class coalitions because one of the things from the 17th century in the americas is that white indentured servants and african black african slaves who were treated much much the same who lived together who loved together who who worked together um they often rebelled together too um and there were a whole series of rebellions um, um which in which white servants and black slaves took common part. Was it a conscious decision to drive a wedge between them? Between, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there, there are two, uh, there are two um, examples I give of, of where this was, where the idea of racial distinction was used consciously. One was um, early slavery, the, the other is Jim Crow, which is also a conscious use of racial distinctions to, to break up what we now call cross-racial class coalitions um, between um, those at the bottom who, who, who rebelled together. 
it was far easier, of course, to in in, in the days of in, in the seventeenth century, um, for white servants who um, who who fled, who escaped their their, their bondage, um, to find refuge in communities that were largely white. Um, though again, again, this is we think about these uh, whiteness as something that's always existed. Seventeenth century. Uh, um, Americans did not think of themselves as white. I mean, white, again, is another one of those concepts that, that comes into being later on. And part of, the, part of making that distinction between um, Europeans as white, servants as white, and African slaves as black was part of the process by which whiteness also comes into being, the notion of whiteness. Um, um, and, and so... Um, in Virginia, for instance, they had um, they introduced laws that um, the in a way that the, the for uh, if any African slave escaped, their possessions could be used, bought and and and, and sold off and be um, uh, used to to help white servants, which is a perfect way of of um, of uh, uh, creating divide and rule. Um, and so, yes, in 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 the seventeenth century, um, race became both a legitimation of slavery and a way of creating a divide between um, black people in bondage and white people in bondage. It has also stayed with us to such a dramatic degree. And I mean, when you look around in Europe today, when you look around in the United States, or frankly across the globe, you see a resurgence of this kind of thinking, which I think makes it all the more under important to understand um, how we get to the, got to this point. So I'd really like to devote some time to understanding, first of all, how, it, how this concept of race still controls our perception, also our political perception, but also um, perhaps you know how what the role of populism this in this is but let's just come to this to this concept which you've just elucidated was an an arbitrary concept um that was created for a certain political and economic end um that is not a natural category in which people perceive one another um Yet 400 or 300 years later, it is still very much with us and it still very much determines the political, um, the political debate. And it has become a truism that it is based on biology and therefore an objective truth. Well, in, in many ways, actually, the, um, when we talk about race and racial distinctions today, we don't really talk about biology, we talk about culture. I mean, culture has become the, the language of human differences. Um, and, I mean, we, we, you know, so the, 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 there is an elision between race and culture. Um, we talk about black race and black culture, white race and white culture, and so on. And there are kind of many strands to that. And the, the One is the way that in the post-war world... Um, culture came to replace race as the medium of understanding human differences um, in 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 the wake of the nazism and the holocaust it became much more difficult to hold the kinds of views about biological race and human differences that had been um deeply embedded in 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 in, in uh, pre-war society you just sounded too much like a Nazi if you repeated those things afterwards. Yeah, well, that's right. Uh, and um, so the idea of culture comes in, um, and we start thinking about human differences in terms of culture, ethnic pluralism, um, for instance. I mean, ethnicity is, a, is itself a concept that comes in largely in the 30s. Um, um, when when you know, intellectuals, um, researchers were were trying grappling with the, with, with racial differences what 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 they saw as real important differences but they didn't want to use the concept of race so ethnicity comes in 
which kind of softens the the, the notion of, of race. You are one of the most perceptive critics, I think, of this idea of multiculturalism, of the idea of cultural communities. And that is something that so many people use as a trope in their speaking, but also in their thinking about how society works that I think it's tremendously important how you unwrap this, why multiculturalism is not the emancipating idea that it may appear to be. Sure. I, th I think the first point I'd make is that there's a diff I make a difference between multiculturalism and diversity. I mean, part of the problem with, with the use of the concept multiculturalism is that it actually refers to many different concepts. But, but there's, it's, there's a difference between diversity as the lived experience of difference in, in societies, that are societies that have been um, enriched, um, not just by immigration, but, but, but primarily by immigration, but um, that have been enriched, made more open, made more cosmopolitan. Um, so, so diversity is one thing. Multiculturalism is not diversity as such. It is about the management of diversity. It's about putting people into different um, racial, ethnic, cultural, faith boxes and defining those, the, those people, their needs, their aspirations, their, um, uh, their, their, their rights and so on, but according to the boxes into which they've been put. Um, and that's the problem. The problem is not diversity. It's a manage. It's a way society have come to manage diversity and thinking it's 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 it's, it's important to, to to manage it in particular ways by putting people into those boxes. This thinking in multiculturalist boxes, um, which makes it also, of course, which makes those people recognizable for the state. Because if you have a box, you can have an organization that is attached to the box. And so you, as a young man who saw himself as black, were represented to the state by some imam at a mosque because you were part of the Muslim community, according to your origin, uh, which also shows how this, these categories didn't apply at all. But of course, it gives the state purchase on this whole um, complexity of society. Yeah. I mean, um, I've written a lot about how that whole concept develops in, in Britain, for instance, which is... Um, it comes precisely because the state wanted um, some way of, of talking to different groups within society. Um, and so, um, you know, when I grew up, we didn't think of ourselves as um, Muslim or Hindu or, 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 or even as um uh, I suppose we thought of our broad terms as Asian. Asian became a category, but, but broadly we were black. Um, we, we, we didn't have those kinds of narrow parochial identities and differences that that um, uh, we have today. Um, and part of what happened in Britain, um, historically, if, if, if you want to kind of history of this, is that in the late 70s, early 80s, there was a series of... Um, violent eruptions, riots in Britain's inner cities in response to um, uh, racist policing. Um, it, Britain in, in the 70s and 80s uh, was a very different place than it is today. It was, it was a place in which racism was, was uh, deeply, viscerally woven into the fabric of society in which racist attacks were commonplace. I mean, I grew up at a time when... Um, I, I would expect to be attacked and, and need to defend myself um, when, um, you know, police were openly racist, um, um, institutionally racist. Um, when, um, uh, you know, if you were attacked, the last, if, if you're attacked as, you know, a black person or as a nation, you, you, the last p place you'd go to was to the police for help because you're more likely to be arrested yourself than um, than the perpetrator, so it, it was. It's just. It's just explained. That it was a very different kind of place, uh, and the and 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 the and the the riots in in the seventies, the seventies and and nineteen eighties were were a reflection um, of the anger of that, and um, the authorities recognised that in order to um, uh, 
to, to, to deal with this issue, they had to draw minorities into the political process, make them part of the um, institutional structure of, 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 of society. And um, one of the ways they did that was to look for certain um, community leaders, certain institutions with which, with whom they, 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 they could have a dialogue. And it, within Muslim communities, th th they happened to th th they were largely the mosques, largely the mosques, because the mosques were the, the the most conservative of the institutions within within those those societies. Even and it's from, you have to remember that it was that we never thought of ourselves as Muslim. Even my parents wouldn't have thought of. I mean, my my, my mother wasn't Muslim. My mother was Hindu. My father was was Muslim, um, but he wouldn't have thought of himself as Muslim as a public identity. Um, it was um, Islam um, was was a was a was a private faith. They used to go to um, mosque when, when when they felt like it. Um, my father used to drink. Um, no woman would wear a hijab in those days. Um, so um, it, again, that too is a very different kind of place than it, than, than it is now. Um, and so they start, they, um, the, the state, both at local and national level, started funneling money through certain institutions, um, in uh, certain organisations, which became de facto then the, 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 the leadership of that community. But, the, but the, the, the leadership, largely because they had a relationship with the state, not because they had a relationship with um, ordinary people. Their own constituency. That's right. And, and, you know, through the 80s, there was big struggles within what we now call Muslim communities um, between those who want to be seen as Muslim and those who didn't, um, and between those who um, accepted the, 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 um, the, 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 the significance of, of Muslim, um, of, of religious organisations and of the mosque and those who, who, who refused to. Um, you know, I was, again, I was of a generation um, that fought both racism from the, from the state and from society, and the 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 the, 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 the imposition of um, norms from from from, from um, religious institutions. We were as opposed to the mosques as we were to to the racists. You had to struggle from from two directions, really. Um, you had a double struggle for liberation. That's right. Um, and it must be a little bit infuriating if that results in a world in which you are asked to stay in your cultural lane and stick to your authentic culture. It, again, the, there, are, there are a number of different threads to, to, to how that happens. Um, so the, the idea of identity becomes um, of, of a narrow um, more parochial identity becomes much stronger, and it does so not simply because um, of the rise of uh, multicultural thinking. It does so also because um, what I call in the book the radical universalist tradition. Um, um, that dip, that tradition, which you know, we, which includes a, a kind of disparate group of people I mean, historically from. You know, um, uh, Frederick Douglass to, to C. L. R. James from um, uh, from uh, someone like um, Pauli Murray to um, uh, uh, to, to, to uh, someone like um, Richard Wright, for instance. I mean, there's a kind of wide variety of, of, of people within the, within that tradition, but that depends. That tradition depends. On the ability or, 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 the, or, or the belief that it is possible to um, transform society, to work collectively, transform society to make society a better place, um, and that that belief has, has largely ebbed over the last 30, 40, 50 years. Um, because why I'll, do you think that is? Well, the, again, there there are a number of um, factors, um, but those radical struggles have gone. Um, those radical movements have gone. Um, they've either they, they've either disappeared or become corrupted, um, and you can you can see that both within Western nations in terms of 
um, the, the old um, radical social movements, um, uh, or, or you can see it um, out in 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 um, Africa, Asia, the Caribbean, where the old um, liberation movements have become uh, corrupted and uh, despoiled. Cuba. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I mean, South Africa, India, Turkey. Algeria. I mean, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, Cuba is such a perfect example sure. um, of you know having having survived its own revolution. But um, you you say that they have gone. But I mean, what what destroyed them? Why why didn't they survive anywhere? Why is this social radicalism, this transformative radicalism, seemingly at the moment dried up? If you look at what happened in the seventies and eighties more broadly, what happened was that. The, um, the, the in, in, certainly in the West, the, the old um, Keynesian post-world order gave way to what we now call neoliberalism. The, the, um, the whole basis on which um, the state relates to the individual changes and the state relates to the market changes in, in the, in the, in the um, 80s and 90s, the, the, what we call the Reaganism and Thatcherism and so on. But wouldn't that motivate radical movements? It, well, what happened was so those movements, um, particularly um, uh, labour organisation movements, um, labour organisations, um, got destroyed. Um, trade unions um, became, were, were neutered, um, and radicalism itself, as a as a as a way of thinking about the world, um, largely disappeared. I mean, in part, of course, the, the, it, it, the, the, the left had been moving in that direction for a long time. Um, you, know, you, you can trace its roots back to the late 50s, early 60s, um, and the new left, and, and it's um, to the rise of, this, of, of the social, new social movements um, with, the, with the new left, um, which uh, w w which in many ways, um, were were whereas in the in in the past the old left looked to the working class as as, as a agent of change. That, but by by the fifties and sixties, many on the left thought that working class had been bought up by consumerism, and that there were there, there was it was, it was they were no longer the a possibility of of. Um, uh, of the working class transforming society and that became part of a, a broader way of looking at um trans social transformation and of radicalism was that carried by a kind of disappointment that that so-called realization that um that the left i mean that the, the left had as you said that the working people no longer were willing to be agents of this world revolution but were quite happy to sit on their sofa and watch television that's how it was posed i mean i i, I don't think in reality it, it, it was quite like that um and it, you look at working class discontent for you know <laughs> um that it never went away um um so yes but that's how it became seen by the left um, and so th 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 those kinds of movements, those kinds of organisation, um, um, the, the roots, the roots of the of, of the shift lie back in the sixties, um, but 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 the real shift takes place in the nineteen eighties. It always seems to me that this deindustrialization plays a very major role in it that does. because yeah. effectively, well, that's right. Um, I mean, whether whether labor intellectuals think or not that the working class is an agent of change, it is still a recognizable part of society that looks after its own interests. And it is tied to heavy industry and to coal mines and with globalized industry and with oil as a driver of industrial labor. Um, all of a sudden that chain is broken. And of course, while the industries and the energy can come from somewhere else, the people remain, but they no longer have a class identity and they also no longer have a bargaining power. Yeah, there, 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 are, there again, there are a number of points. The first is that it's not simply those who work in heavy industry who are working class. I mean, the working class um, 
you know, working. No, but it was the most recognisable colonel. I, I know, but, but, but in a sense, that's a part of the problem. The problem is that we still think about the working class in terms of the industrial working class, not in terms of people who work in um, call centres or who work in um, uh, warehouses or work for Amazon, who were Uber drivers. Do they think of themselves as working class? Increasingly, interestingly, if, if you look at the strikes and, 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 um, by Amazon workers, both in America uh, and in Europe, um, um, it's much more difficult, of course, um, if you're not in a specific workplace and have um, specific um, uh, ways of organising yourself um, to, to, to have that sense of working class identity. Um, but the fact that um, it's beginning to change now suggests that it, that, um, it is beginning to... Um, that kind of sense that of, of a collective identity um, based on one's um, economic role in society, ba based on one's job, based on who one's employer is and so on. Um, the, that is, it, it's, 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 not, it's not, I'm not saying it's transforming the way um, uh, society, but it's, it's, it's beginning to have a purchase again, which it hasn't had um, for, for a long time. Now, that would be a very important development because, um, I mean, that kind of left politics cannot be just made among middle-class intellectuals in big cities. Um, it needs a, a much, much broader base and it also needs a much, much stronger consciousness. It does, though I'd say part of the problem, though, uh, and this is the problem with, with um, the way... Um, we think about the working class, the, the way um, those it, w within the working class think about themselves, is that just as culture becomes an identity, becomes the language of minority groups uh, and of women and of um, gays and so on, it has also become the language of the working class. So the working, w the working class comes to see itself um, because there is no other language. I mean, that, that's the point. The point is that that's the only language we have to understand our place in society and, and our relationships um, to others in society. So, so the working class has become as much a, a cultural concept as an economic or political or social concept. And it has almost become a racialized concept. So we talk about the white working class where... Um, the whiteness often matters more than the class location um, in, in terms of um, where they are, what they need, what, what their problems are and so on. And so it's this, um, it's the way that working class, uh, that class itself has become uh, a cultural identity as opposed to a relationship, a, 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 a economic or social relationship. Um, that is part of the problem. Um, that may be part of the problem. It also, I mean, it may be, it may be at the very heart of the problem of much of modern politics. This, ra this relationship between race and identity politics, and how they can be played off against one another. Um, it seems to me that the sort of vectors of identity, I mean, the ways we have of determining identity have become very uncertain in recent decades and are becoming more uncertain also because of an influence of technology, um, of new technologies that, that shake many certainties of what people uh, thought about their own identities. Um, we are right before a very possible wave of right-wing policies of, of uh, right-wing politicians also in Europe um, moving our countries away from liberalism, I mean from philosophical liberalism, not so much economic liberalism um, moving our countries away from democracy quite frankly um, 
Talk to me about how race and cultural identity can pl be played off against each other and are being played off against each other. Well, in a way, we've got um, a new form of, of mass politics where um, because to be wor the working class has become a cultural concept as opposed to an economic or social concept and because the working class um, a class has become um, a way of um, it's defined in in, in 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 terms of culture and history and heritage it's easy then to then define it against the other who doesn't belong who doesn't have that history and uh, uh, culture and heritage uh, migrants and Muslims in particular um, and what you have is, is is a new form of mass politics in which that that, that kind of reactionary notion of identity becomes co coalesces with the kinds of the kinds of policies that once were the staple of the left before before social democratic parties moved away from its from their old working class roots um, support for for jobs for the welfare state. Um, uh, uh, against austerity uh, and so on, and that those two have come together, and, and, and a, a lot of um, uh, populist far right groups uh, meld those two aspects um, in, in 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 their approach to, um, to to politics. I I want to I want to delve a, bit, a little bit deeper into this because I do feel that. We live in societies that have lost a sense of hope, lost a sense of a positive future, and they very often have lost a benign sense of identity, a benign sense of belonging. But they have replaced um, these identities perhaps with identities that are a result of consumer decisions, simply what stuff you buy, how you signal yourself to others what you are. Or you have to construct them very consciously, and you and, and their populism makes the most, shall we say, the loudest offers on the marketplace of how to construct your identity. Um, ethnicity becomes a very important vector in this, and is used as a very important part of the political discussion. Um, if you look at the future in a country like Britain, which is ethnically diverse, uh, which is culturally diverse, how can that work and how can that not result in ethnicity being used once again as a mode for political division, as a tool for political division? Well, the interesting thing in Britain is that uh, it's surprisingly, certainly compared to most European countries, it is surprisingly liberal. Uh, the 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 the, the, um, the 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 population is surprisingly liberal when it comes to issues such as immigration. It's become more liberal over the past ten years. Um, um, and if you, if you if you polls which ask, yet it played a big role in Brexit, take back control. It did. Though, though I mean, I, I, Brexit is not was not simply about immigration. It was about. Um, and take back control expressed a kind of wider frustration of people um, um, and not just you know the white working class but um but wider frustration that um they have little control over politics that they have little control over their lives that they have little control in determining the kinds of policies that are, that are necessary um and that's been a, 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 a sense that's been developed since the 80s and the 90s. Um, part, I mean, and again, we've talked about some of the reasons. I mean, there are other reasons. And um, the movement, the move of the of social democratic parties away from um, their working class roots, um, uh, that their acceptance of neoliberal ideas. Um, the, their acceptance of many of many social democratic parties of um, uh, austerity policies and so on. I mean, there are a whole host of 
re- uh, reasons why large groups in the pop of, of the population feel um, uh, abandoned and voiceless. And where in the past disaffection? I mean, disaffection is not a bad thing. Disaffection is a good thing. It shows you want change. So disaffection is not a bad thing. But where in the past that disaffection could have been shaped in a more progressive direction, all the, the, those progressive movements, those pro, pro, the, those radical movements, have disappeared, and so. Um, the only o- groups and organisations capable of shaping that that disaffection come from the right, the reactionary right, the far right, um, and that's what. And that that's not a European phenomenon. That's a global phenomenon. If you look at India, if you look at Turkey, if you look at Algeria, if you look at South Africa, you, you'll see it all, exactly the same um, process um, taking place. And so what, what we're talking about is um, the, 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 in, in all these cases, actually, what about, it's a collapse of what I, what I call the, the uh, more universalist perspective uh, and, and, the, and the rise of much more narrow identitarian perspectives. Um, so, if what's interesting, if you look at the language of the far right in Europe today, it is a language of identity. It is a language of pluralism. Um, that um, the, 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 the 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 insistence that we are we are Europeans. Um, we Europeans have a homeland. That. Um, that we're losing our history and heritage and culture um, to invaders and so on. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the language that used to be um, mistake, the mistakenly the left uh, adopted um, in its views about multiculturalism and its views about pluralism, which has now been kind of taken back by the right, um, by the far right, to... Um, uh, to frame racism um, as a form of identity politics. That's really what's happened, is that as identity politics have become mainstream, the far right has been able to reframe racism as a defence of identity and and, and, and as a form of, of, of the politics of identity. And so long as the left clings to identity and, and a politics of identity as a means of, of um, improving, um, changing, um, um, making society better, then the, the only winners will be those on the right and the far right who, who, who are much more capable of, of doing that. What I often find in contemporary discussions, especially on the left especially on the avowedly anti-racist, post-colonialist left, is something that I perceive as a worrying kind of essentialism, where there's a search for authentic voices and authentic standpoints, and they are defined ultimately by almost racist means, because it becomes, clear, it, it becomes a question of who is authentic enough to have the authentic voice. Um, that strikes me as one of the very least helpful things we could have in a discussion about pluralist identities. I agree. Um, you can trace this. You can trace this back to uh, um, romantic ideas from, from the early nineteenth century, from Herder in, in particular, and the ambiguity. I mean, it, it, Herder is one of those interesting figures um, who. Um, on the one hand, was a was uh, a great believer in equality, was a great opponent of slavery. Um, but his notion of identity and cultural authenticity, um, and the, and his belief that migration, what he called mixed marriages, and so on, would would pollute um, the authenticity of, of, of particular groups. Um, his 
he, he was no anti-Semite, but his belief that, uh, Ju- that you know Jews were authentic in the old Israel from from from, from two thousand years ago, but were inauthentic in European nations, clearly played a part in 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 um in developing anti-Semitism in, in, in the new form as, as it develops in the 19th century. So that kind of ambiguity, there, so there was an ambiguity at the heart of Herder's cultural pluralism between a defense of um, uh, a welcoming of, 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 of a world of differences and a vision of um, cultural authenticity, which made um, those, those who were different from us um, dangerous. Um, in, in various ways. That kind of ambiguity um, became then reworked in the post-war years through notions of multiculturalism and cultural pluralism, because a notion of culture that came to replace concepts of race in the post-war years um, had, a, had a kind of formal structure, al- almost identical to that of race. Um, that culture became something that uh, that bound people together, without which um, uh, you could not survive. Um, not culture in a, in a broad sense, but culture in a particular sense, um, uh, and that uh, the the culture is what define the differences between different groups. And 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 as you say, an essentialist notion of culture, um, so that the that essence was carried not through biology, as in. Um, the concept of race, but through history, um, as in the concept of. It seems to me that there's a there's a tremendously religious argument at the heart of this, or idea at the heart of this, which is simply the idea of purity. Just you know, the idea that there is such a thing as a pure essence that can be found and defended and preserved, um, which seems to me almost really laughable today because all we learn about our identities at all levels even at the biological level we learn that there's no such a thing as a pure human that um you know we are part neanderthal and we have the dna of viruses in us that um the amount of mixing in history between species between different cultures has been constant and that only for a few hundred years things have become fixed in writing and therefore seemingly controllable. And from this, this idea of a pure and eternal culture has been projected back into history and is still being projected back into history. Sure, but in, in a sense, the, 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 the argument that um, we are all mixed has, has no bearing on, in, in a, or has no purchase on... The, the the notions of identity that that people hold on to now um, it, it's immaterial to them. Not on the notions of identity, yes, but um, it it simply shows how much these notions are projections out of political reasons or perhaps polit- reasons of the need to feel belonging. Um, they. You know, everything that we learn scientifically about how life functions contradicts this. Everything we learn from archaeology, from ancient history about how societies and cultures have functions and interacted, contradicts this. But it is a fun- it is a fiction that is so fundamentally important for people's sense of identity that none of that matters. That wasn't the point I was making. Sure. No, that's right. Um, but it's also the case that how we think about solidarity or how we think about social affiliations has changed quite dramatically over the past 30 or 40 years. I mean, again, we can, there, there are two ways we can think about solidarity. Um, one is um, that we come together, we form um, uh, collectives um, because um, of our values, in other words, that the, 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 um, I affiliate with people um, not because of their skin colour or their culture or their faith, but because they have the same social values, political values as I do, um, and that we want to 
trans we want to transform society we want to change society according to those values that those, 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 those sort of values we'd like to see embedded in society um but there there is another way of looking at this which is which is to say that um what matters are not values but one's identity and values come from identity that that whether whatever one's identity is um gives you the values by which you live um uh and in 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 a sense both both are all movements, all organisations, um, all political organisations, all political parties have a bit of both in them. But what has happened over the the past um, uh, few decades is that the idea of um, commonality has been defined by identity, irrespective of values, rather than the idea of commonality being being defined by values, irrespective of identity. That the, the the first has come to to dominate, um, so we come to see solidarity in terms of, you know, we, the questions we ask ourselves is not what kind of society do we want to live, but who are we, and that we define who we are, in terms not by the kind of society we want to live in, but by our past, our history, our heritage, our 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 supposed history and heritage, and. Um, um, and the kinds of societies we want to live in are become defined by who we are rather than the values of those societies. And so there's been a shift in, in, in the way we think about solidarity and the way we think about identity, um, which has been deeply inimical. Do you think that shift is so overwhelming that it will stay with us for the rest of our lives, that shift towards a closed kind of cultural identity? I don't know. That is on the right and on the left, one has to say. They're just different constructions of identity, but con identity constructions on the left are just as closed. No, I agree. Um, uh, I'm, 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 you know, much, of my, much of my work on this has been uh, because of um, trying to challenge those kinds of ideas on the left. Um, it, it's, it's not, I mean, uh, you know, I, 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 because I see these as conservative reactionary ideas, but which have been appropriated by the left, um, uh, that's, you know, that's at the heart of, of, of much of my, of my thinking. Um, the, the answer, I don't know wh whether it'll remain like that because, um, it depends on on the kinds of movements and 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 struggles and and, and forms of solidarity that, that we build in 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 the in the decades to come um so that's an open question as, as to whether it'll it'll stay in that way or not do you see the beginnings of a serious kind of resistance of a serious kind of um different way of doing politics that you think perhaps this is not the way it has to go despite the fact i mean you know there is there's a school of thought that i reluctantly sympathize with that says liberal democracies with all their ethical advancements were partly also piggybacking on the on the oil boom They were a function of societies that grew in wealth and in security and that could afford to think of all those things. And now that times are turning harder, now that, return, that history returns, it may turn out that democracy was a passing phase and that human rights were the cherry on that cake that is now rotting in the sun. I, I, w I would look at it differently. What I'd say is that what we call I hope so. well, what we call liberal norms um, have come about and have achieved social purchase not through liberals but through radicals, and it's the radical movements, the the movements of you know from the 18th century onwards. It's the radical movements, um, uh, the the. Um, Social Democratic Parties, the, the early Social Democratic Parties, trade unions, working class organisations, 
um, revolutionary groups that through the struggles of of of, of, who, of which the um, ideas such as equality and and democracy, universal suffrage, of free speech, of of the freedom of assembly, all those things, which we now we which we think about as as liberal norms, were in fact brought to being against the old liberal order by by radical movements. That's a very important point, I think. Yes. It is the demise of those radical movements that has allowed liberals um, to backslide on all those, all, all those issues. It means liberals mean, need radicals in order not to become conservatives. Completely. Um, I mean, I mean the, the point is that, in, in, in many ways, radicals need liberals too. Not to fly off the carousel. In the, in, in, in the absence of radicalism, liberalism becomes... Um, uh, not just conservative, but it it fails to understand what it, its own values. It fails to understand its own norms. So, for example, going back to my book, one one of, one of the stories I tell is of the struggle between radical universities and liberal universities. Um, so you had. I mean, one of the interesting things about um, um, about uh, liberals in the in the eighteenth and nineteenth century, um, and which pertains to the idea of race, is that, um, and we've talked about this a bit already, is that um, their attachment to liberty and to equality um, was entirely in the abstract, and that. It was the liberal order in, in Europe and America um, that refused to acknowledge or, or, or um, uh, uh, that 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 insisted that only certain peoples have the right to equality and liberty, and then the, the most of the world don't. Um, that you know, the basis of colonialism, um, the basis of racism, and so on. I was going to say, it's, it's a radical um, universalist tradition of that time. Um, that, for instance, um, that the challenged European colonialism. So, um, so if, if you take some, something like India, um, after the Indian mutiny, which was, which was an early nationalist insurrection, it wasn't a mutiny, it was a nationalist insurrection, um, John Stuart Mill, Who's you know the kind of lodestar of Victorian liberalism and um, very um, and who's worth you know his book on liberty is still worth reading. Um, he defend he he was also a defender of colonialism, and he wrote a long memorandum to Parliament, defending the 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 um, the, the East India Company for which he worked in in, in India, defending colonialism on the basis of all the benefits it brought to India. Civilization it will bring to India. Whereas working class radicals um, around um, you know, the, 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 the latest, later Chartists, around, um, or, around um, newspapers such as the People's Paper, which is a, an important um, radical newspaper at the time, for instance, made, made the point that um, just as in Europe we support the the, the struggles of peoples against um, uh, colonial rule, S support pe um, Poles against Russians, support Hungarians against Austrians. So in India, we should support um, Indians against the British because these kinds of liberal norms apply to everyone or they don't apply at all. Where do you see the working class radicals of today? Do you see them in the climate movement? Do you see them in other areas of society? I mean, is this a spent force, as you say, or can you? Are there any any sparks where you think, "Hello, something is beginning here that's interesting"? Well, I think yeah, we have to look at it at, at almost at two levels. There are local struggles struggles over housing, over wages, over conditions, uh, um, uh, uh, and so on, education. Um, and out of those struggles um, 
we have to turn into struggles, um, not just for particular groups or for, for, for narrow sexual interests, but become part of a, a, a broader way of looking at the world and, 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 and um, who it is that, uh, who, who is suffering and, and, and why and, and what we need to, to, to overcome that. Then there is a, a kind of broader um, uh, level at which we, we, we need to, to engage. Um, for example, uh, on migration, where, um, you know, I, I think it's one of the kind of great scandals of, of, of the, the um, EU policy, um, and not just the EU policy, kind of the, the policies of rich Western nations towards migrants, um, which is effectively to um, get poor countries to take responsibility for migrants, um, whether it's offshoring, whether it's the kinds of policies that the EU is, is, is promoting in, in, in North Africa, where it's effectively turned to every coercive force in North Africa, in the Sahel, in the Horn of Africa, um, to to kid, create a kidnap and deten detention industry um, uh, to where, where, where hundreds of thousands of people um, are being held, um, are, are being imprisoned as, uh, often in the, not hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands of people in, in the most um, um, uh, obnoxious of circumstances at the behest of the EU um, because they might be migrants coming to, to, to Europe. And that um, organisations such as the old Janjaweed, which has rebadged the, 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 the genocidal um, movement in, in Sudan, which rebadged itself as the RSF, um, has become a uh, effectively a, 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 an immigration police for the, for the EU. Um, so at that level too, we, we, we need to... To, to, to challenge um, uh, policies as they are now, and somehow, somewhere, to be able to stitch the, the, the struggles on the ground with those kind of broader ideas um, and, 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 and needs and struggles, um, and to be able to stitch those two together. Are those broader ideas and needs and struggles, for instance, the climate catastrophe, are they enough to inspire a social movement that leaves the concept of race behind us? Uh, I'm not sure that they're, that they're enough to, um, to inspire a social movement that leaves the concept of race behind us. I mean, they will, there, there are social movements being built around questions of, of climate, um, um, which can be, I mean, the, 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 those movements can be parochial as well as they can be... Um, um, uh, you know, uh, broad-minded. Um, so that's not a, a the, the issue itself. Um, is not one that that automatically lends itself to um, a new way of thinking about about the world. It, it, it can be. Um, it, can, it can also accommodate old ways of thinking about the world. So, um, so yes. Um, I'm not sure that uh, I, w I wouldn't agree that that, the, that that in itself that's a way of, of not thinking about um, racial concepts, um, but I would say that it is those building those kinds of movements gives us an opportunity to challenge those kinds of old, those old kinds of ideas which are holding us back. Well, let's hope they will do that. Kenan, thank you so much for being my guest and answering my questions patiently and in great detail. Thank you for having me. Your book, Not So Black and White, is out and is a fantastic read of stories of analysis and of thoughts that really carry us further. You can subscribe to this podcast. You can like it. That helps with the algorithm and therefore it helps me. It makes the world a better place. Ken and Malik, thank you for being my guest and thank you for listening to us. Bye-bye.